on the face of this earth that is following God's Bible. None of your congregations are having God's Sabbath day on the seventh day. That's the test commandment for Ezekiel 20.20. 20. But your ministers won't put back God's Sabbath day to the seventh day. Instead, they'll follow the phony 1883 international dateline. 
And your ministers refuse, refuse to celebrate the four fasts of the Lord. They won't do what the Bible says. They refuse to celebrate New Month Day, which was on Thursday, marking ER1. Yes, Ezekiel 46.3 commands you to have a worship service and for the members to appear before God on the New Month Day. But your ministers strike Ezekiel 46.3 out of your Bible. The audacity of your ministers, the deceit of your ministers, and then they say that they follow God's Bible. They ignore the four fasts of the Lord. They lie and say they follow God's Bible. They move God's Sabbath to the sixth day, Friday. And they say, but they say they follow God's Bible. They're liars! And you support them. You support liars. Both of you are going to be judged, your minister and you. And if you practice a lie, Revelation states that you will be outside locked where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. You have it in Revelation 22, the last book, last chapter of the Bible. Whoever practices a lie, verse 15 of Revelation 22, you practice a lie, you pay the Pope to move God's Sabbath day to Sunday, you pay your minister to move God's Sabbath day to Friday in half the world, with a phony international dateline from 1883, you're practicing a lie. You refuse to show up on New Month Day, and you say you follow the Bible, you're a liar. And your minister, for him, go to Revelation 21, 27, there shall be by no means enter it anything that causes a lie. Your ministers are causing a lie. Your ministers are going straight into hell because they are violating God's Bible willfully. And you're going to go straight into hell right behind them because you're following what your ministers say and not what God says. It's unbelievable how none of you want to repent. It's just like the Israelites. Now I can see how it was for the Israelites who didn't repent. It was unbelievable. You say, oh, if I was one of the Israelites, I wouldn't have done what they did. Well, you're doing the exact same thing. You're disobeying God. You're doing the exact same thing, following the same ways of disobedience. And then one minister has got you doing the satanic Kabbalah with an, what he calls an Omer count. He's got you practicing the Kabbalic tree of life, the Sifirot, with its 22 channels going hard into Gevir, Gevir into Teferit, Teferit back into Hod, the same tree that the tarot cards are built on. And he says he's obeying God. Well, I've got news for him. He's obeying Satan. He's got the wrong God. You know, you think he can say he thanks God for the satanic cabal account? Well, he's thanking the wrong God. He's thanking Satan. Because it was Satan who wrote that Sifrod count, because that was all done via automatic writing. The Kabbalah was done and the Zohar was done with automatic writing from demons. So anyone who says they're going to thank God for the Kabbalah count is saying they're going to thank Satan, because Satan wrote it. God didn't write it. 
the civil road count is not in God's Bible. What is in God's Bible is to count 49 cups. Here's what a cup looks like for all you doomcock ministers. See? A cup. You're supposed to count 49 cups. Then the 50th day is Pentecost. That's what your Bible says. But you want to follow Jewish mysticism. And your members want to be following Jewish mysticism. So you all go into the lake of fire. Not my fault. I warned you. I told you that the Kabbalah is satanic. I told you that the Sifrod count is satanic. I showed you how the tree of life that the Kabbalah uses is on a witches and warlocks site called the Tarot Tree of Life, T-A-R-O-T, Tarot Cards. Even with that information, your minister won't repent. He just keeps blathering away. Well, he's going to go into hell. He can't be used because he won't repent. And the days of examination, I told you, <laughs> that you should be examining your church to be examining your church. Now today is the 18th day of the cup count. We can't even say Omer count because lying ministers have twisted it to mean something totally different than a measure. So we'll call it the cup count. It's the 18th day. It's ER3, the second month, of the new year. And today we've got a dynamite service for you as usual because we've got to have you understand, give you the explanation of what is going on in the world that nobody else understands. This involves the dividing of Jerusalem. It's happening right now. All the paperwork's been done. The formal signing will be done on May the 24th, May the 27th, when the poop, P-O-O-P, yeah, the poop, Mr. Fishhead, you know, a guy with $5,000 hat, with the big mouth open of the fish's mouth open on the top of his hat, the jewel in the front, then you turn it sideways and the jewel is the eye, and then you see the mouth of the fish. And he's got his flowing gown on down his back, so he looks like a fish. That's Mr. Fishhead, Dagon, the fish god. He's going to Jerusalem on the 24th, 27th, to sign an actual deal which will be chopping up the city of Jerusalem. But none of your ministers can figure this out. None of, none of them know what's going on. They won't do their homework. You know, they'll, they'll just blather on with another empty sermon. Well, here, we'll tell you today that there is a terrible, terrible plan called, this is your bare note, the Holy Basin. B-A-S-I-N. The plan is called the Holy Basin. And it is to split Jerusalem into three parts. The city of Jerusalem will be split into three parts between the Muslims, the Christians, and the Jews. Now, the Muslims we'll get the Temple Mount. And the Pope, allegedly the Christian, will get the Church of the Holy Sepulchre and Mount Zion. And we'll get the manger station. Now, it hasn't all been signed in yet. But the plan, the secret plan, is they're 
taking Jerusalem piece by piece. And they're going to take over all of the holy sites of Jerusalem. And they're taking it away piece by piece. Their dirty plan is to split Jerusalem's holy sites between various religions, and they're going to implement it in stages. And during the Pope's next visit, they plan to transfer, bear note, the Senecal on Mount Zion to the poop, turning it into a pilgrimage site. This is fulfilling prophecy because all of Jerusalem will be split. But none of your ministers are preaching on this and how important it is. And what do the Jews get in return? They'll have to get permission now, after this is all signed, to visit the Western Wall under the auspices of the Palestinian Authority. This is ridiculous. The Palestinian Authority will escort, give permission to Jews to go to their own Western Wall. Now, what has the Palestinian Authority, Palestinian Authority TV, said about Jewish worship on the holy site, the Western Wall? Palestinian TV labels the Jewish worship sin and filth. Now, I got news for them, for the Palestinian Authority. That's God's site you're calling sin and filth. That's God's temple site. Now, even if the Jewish worship at the wall, at the hotel, to freely, the loss of access to the Temple Mount would be highly significant. The Temple Mount is the holiest site on this earth, according to the Bible, Judaism, and it's the place where the first temple and the second temple were. They're going to forbid Jews to go to the Temple Mount where the Dome of the Rock is. Let me tell you about the Dome of the Rock, what happens at prayer time. All of the Muslims then turn their asses to the Dome of the Rock. Yeah, their behinds to the Dome of the Rock and face the East when it's prayer time to Allah. So all their asses are sticking up towards the Dome of the Rock as they're facing East. That's how sacred the temple is to them, the Temple Mount, where the Dome of the Rock is, they all stick their asses up at it. God is coming back, Yeshua is coming back, and he is going to be so ticked off, he's going to be so mad, and he's got every right to be mad. There's going to be blood flowing in the streets of Jerusalem when he arrives. Because he's not going to put up with any more of his bull. And he's not going to put up any, with any bull from your ministers of a phony Cifero count and adding a Cifero count that is not, not, not in your Bible. You are told to count 49 days. Period. Not use a satanic Kabbalah that has been written by demons to get you to improve yourself the way the witches and warlocks do. You know, I'd be shuddering in my boots if I found that out and I was doing it. But your ministers say they thank God for a Cifero count. Boy, <laughs> they're going to have to answer to God for that one. Yeah, just goes on and on and on and on. More lies and more deceptions with your ministers. Got the all following Turkey God Day, bird that gave its life for its young, that laid the cosmic egg that raw Cyrus sprang forth from. That's why you've got a Turkey God on your table. That's right. That's why you've got an eighth 
day to the seven day feast of tabernacles because your minister is a lying devil. All your ministers have, quote, Thanksgiving Turkey God Day. They're all deceived lying devils. And they won't repent. And they won't discuss it. And they won't go back into the history, which is very simple to find of, of the Kern babies, the corn babies that were all in the you know, Presbyterian churches over in England and the tradition came right along because Bradford had it for three days the same way as the Pawnee Indians had it. Three-day festival. It didn't pop into Bradford's mind. It was a pagan celebration right from the first day and it went on for the three-day pagan festival exactly like the Pawnee Indians had always had the three-day festival. But your minister will lie and he'll say, that's fine to add it to the Bible when Deuteronomy 12.32 says, do not add one thing to God's Bible. Do not add to God's Bible. How can your minister say that he is going to add to God's Bible? Let's read it. Deuteronomy 12, 32. Well, 31 here. Well, let's just stick with the 32 that I said. You shall not add to it. You shall not add to it. You shall not add to the Feast of Tabernacles. And go back to verse 30 where it says, how did these nations serve their gods? I will do likewise. You know, Turkey God Day. How, how do the Gentiles serve God? You, 31, you shall not worship the Lord your God in that way. But your minister, lying devil he is, will continue to lead you astray. I told you on the broadcast from the new month day, it's your minister's who are stealing Yeshua away from you. Your ministers have stole Yeshua's body. And your ministers are stealing Yeshua's body today by claiming them that they're obeying God's Bible. When they're disobeying God's Bible, they're stealing your eternal life. Thank and bring Triumph Prophetic Ministries is stealing your eternal life by teaching you a Kabbalah Sifirot count and teaching you Turkey God Day. That's a fact that cannot be denied. Along with moving God's Sabbath day to Friday in half the world, he does that, Dankenbrink does that, so does Bob Thiel, so does Roderick Meredith, so do all of the Seventh-day Adventists, so do the whole Jewish community, and I've contacted the highest uh, rabbis that I can get to, and their underlings say, their answer is, uh, it's under consideration. Well, it's been under consideration since 1883 when they first moved the Sabbath day back to Friday. Since 1883. We're here as a witness work. We're the Romans 9.28 work. We're restoring all things, whether you say so or not. And if you say we haven't restored anything, Bob Thiel, of Continuing Church of God, you are a liar, Bob Thiel because we have restored the Sabbath day to the seventh day, because we have a congregation of 200 plus in Pakistan that waits for the sun to go down. So we have restored God's Sabbath day, and we have restored the four fasts of the Lord for our membership, and we have restored the Passover to 19 minutes before the 15th starts. And we have restored the Last Supper. We had it on the 12th. We had it on the 12th. And then we had the Passover on the 14th. Your ministers don't have anything right. They don't even know the difference between the Passover and the Last Supper. And 
they're leading, leading you straight into the gates of hell. Well, today we're going to explain to you what the other devil minister, the poop, is doing. And that's important for you to know. Because Pope Francis is visiting the Holy Land. And his itinerary, you know, his trip to Jordan, West Bank, Israel, between May the 24th and 26th, which is a Saturday and a Monday at the end of this month, from Saturday to Monday. So we'll keep an eye and keep you posted on that. We'll tell you more about the dividing of Jerusalem. We'll also tell you about the upper room. You, from all of the misinformation on when you even try to find any information, write this down. Here's your bear note regarding the upper room. Here's their trick. He is, the poop, is going to be given control of the upper room. But he's not going to be given possession of it. That's their trick. That's the agreement that is actually made. It took me about two hours to trace down the actual agreement. Because the two sides have essentially decided to agree to disagree on the matter. And the agreement was that the upper room is going to be controlled by the Vatican. They're going to have, Vatican is going to have total control of the upper room. So let's get that straight in your bare notes. The Vatican will have total control of the upper room. That's above King David's tomb. That used to be where the first century Christians met, where they first had their first congregation after Yeshua was resurrected in the room above David's tomb. Well, the poop has been given a special modicum, M-O-D-I-C-U-M, of control over the upper room. So they'll allow the Pope to control the upper room. It's just a joke because, well, it's a true fact, but it's so ridiculous because that's the same as owning the upper room to give the Pope control of the upper room. Well, I'll tell you more about that. First, we want to enter the throne room. So all please rise. Face the north heavens, where Yeshua and Father and the 24 elders and the four living creatures are. Raise your arms in praise to Father and to Yeshua. Bow your head in Humility, close your eyes in sincerity. Mighty loving Father, we thank you for the information you give the obedient Church of God so that we can understand your truths. Thank you so much for your information regarding the four fasts. Thank you so much for your information regarding New Month Day. I just celebrated it two days ago on Thursday, and it was wonderful to spend a day with you, Father, and Yeshua. We, the obedient Church of God, vow that we will follow every jot and tittle of your law, and we will not stop raising up our voice like a trumpet to tell the others to repent. Father, strengthen the obedient Church of God and its members. Pour out your Spirit upon the obedient Church of God and its members in double measure so that we have the strength to continue your work. Please inspire the services today, both the hearing and the speaking. Please protect our brother and the 200 plus in Pakistan that you gave us that we taught to wait for the seventh day. That's very important because that was a proof positive that we can teach and the proof that they do wait for the seventh day. So they'll be having a Sabbath tomorrow when the sun sets in their country. Again, Father, please continue to inspire the obedient Church of God and continue to inspire all of your people to understand who listen to this broadcast, especially on the videotapes. So 
So bless this service, service, both the hearing and the speaking. And he asks us all in Yeshua's holy name, Yeshua HaMashiach, our soon arriving warrior, mighty king. Amen. <laughs> you ministers are a joke. You can't even follow the words written down in the Bible. Ezekiel 46, 3. You shall worship on New Month Day. What can't you understand about that? Because you're not worshiping. You weren't here. You weren't having a broadcast on New Month Day, which was on, coincidentally, on uh, May the 1st, ER 1. Why can't you understand Ezekiel 46, 3? Oh, are you going to say, because there isn't a temple in Jerusalem? Well, then you don't have to appear before God on the Sabbath day either, because Ezekiel 46, 3 says you shall worship on the Sabbaths and the new moons. See how evil your ministers are? They refuse to obey God's Bible, and Yeshua is going to kick their butts and they're going to be locked out of the kingdom of God, and you're going to be locked out of the kingdom of God, where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth, because you're only doing half of the things right. And that's why you have five foolish virgins whose lamps ran out of oil. Notice that they were all virgins. Yeah, they, that means they were all called. They were all called. But some of them were impure virgins. And some of them didn't have enough oil. Some of them didn't have a wedding garment on, which is the righteous deeds of the saints. And you know the parable of the man who didn't have the wedding garment on? He was thrown out into outer darkness. You will be thrown out into outer darkness, and yet you continue week after week to ignore the facts. Where were you all on New Month Day, on Thursday? I counted the number of people that tuned in, and it hadn't increased. It hadn't increased. After all these admonitions, it hadn't increased. Should have been snowballing by now. But you're just like the Israelites of old. You refuse to obey. So into the lake of fire you have to go because there are enough demons around. You missed a good service. You even missed the highlight of how to handle demons. Yeah, we won't tell you about that because you missed it. So if you get attacked by a demon, you won't know what to do because you didn't listen to our broadcast. Salah, think on that. Well, now that we're in the throne room, let's praise Father. The beautiful hymns for camera one. Purple fuchsia color of the obedient church of God, camera two. The original words are in here from 1934. We got the last copy. The copy was waiting for us. Yes. Right. Over 70 years. We got the last copy. And the original hymnal was a small brown hymnal. Very humble with a black tape binding on it. And it's eight inches, roughly eight inches tall by five inches wide. Very small hymnal, but the words are powerful. So let's sing some powerful words now. Turn to page number seven. How excellent is thy name. That's Psalm number eight. And sing out. This is the fruit of your lips. Sing out to Father and tell him. How excellent in all the earth, Lord, O oh Lord, is thy name.
should I? How excellent in all the earth his name is. Yet another opportunity. Turn ahead to page number eight, Psalm nine. I will praise thee, O eternal. Sing out. You'll have to answer on the day of judgment why you did not praise God. Worship. This is the Sabbath. You are commanded to worship the Lord your God, not just to sit there. Your job, you've got a job to do, you've got a spiritual job. Your spiritual job is to praise God on the Sabbath day. Because you want to, not because you have to. So sing out page number eight. It's actually fun to do. express spoken from a heart sincere sing out then verse 2 who ne'er with slandering tongue slanders the obedient church of God with malice and deceit while they the ministers refuse to repent the ministers keep on moving God's Sabbath day to Friday and half the world and refuse to repent and then they want to slander the messenger. Hmm. Then they, they've got the audacity to say, Oh, speak smooth things to us. Oh, let there be peace. There won't be any peace until you repent, you ministers. There won't be any peace until you repent. Till you stop moving God's Sabbath day to Friday. Till you stop ignoring Ezekiel 46.3 where you shall worship on new month day. There will be no peace till you repent, Dankenbrink. There'll be no peace till you repent, Theo. There'll be no peace till you repent, Meredith. Who shall dwell on thy holy hill? He who walks in righteousness, not he who walks in unrighteousness. If you believe in that, sing out.
to Father. Because these words, where you say righteousness, you are affirming that you will walk in righteousness, not in unrighteousness. Oh, please be seated. Now we have a situation here where we're on the cusp of world wars. Everything that's going on in the Middle East and everything that's going on in the Ukraine. The Ukraine is becoming particularly, particularly convoluted because we've got essentially three groups there. You've got the Russians who are taking control of their seaport that they've always owned. Then you've got the present government in the Ukraine. And then you've got the former supporters of the former government of the Ukraine that is going against the present government of the Ukraine. So it comes out that there are Ukraine separatists who were basically just fighting off with their hands because Ukrainians' present existing government is a phony set-up proxy USA stooge government. That's right. So you've got these three groups. You've got the original Ukrainian government that was before October the 28th, 2012. Now their supporters are fighting because of the phony Ukrainian government that was set up after October 28, 2012. Then you've got the Russians trying to overthrow the phony Ukraine government that was set up after October the 28, 2012. Then you've got the insurgents fighting the Ukraine government and the Russian gov government troops. As usual, Satan's really got you all confused on who's right. Well, the Ukrainian government has launched a military assault, and this is important for you to understand, on the flashpoint town of Slavyansk, S-L-A-V-Y-A-N-S-K. And that raises the stakes way up, big bit into the pot here in the showdown with Russia. Because Russia has promised catastrophic consequences if Kiev stepped up operations. So what happened was two army helicopters, Russian army helicopters, were shot down, killing two Russian servicemen, including the Russian pilot. And this can trigger the Third World War. Now as we speak, I'll put it on the tape, it's the 3rd of May, as we speak, the army is tightening its noose around the Ukrainian rebel hell town, what they call the rebels, of 160,000 people. Damn. Now the pre-dawn offensive drew a sharp response from Moscow, where a spokesman for President Vladimir Putin said it dealt a final blow 
to a deal clinched last month in Geneva meant to cease the crisis. That means there's no more peace. That means that Putin's representatives are saying a final blow was done to the deal in Geneva for a peace. There will be no peace. That means there's going to be full all out war in the Ukraine. Now, a spokesman for the insurgents in Slavansk, S-L-A-V-Y, A-N-S-K, the epicenter of the tensions in eastern Ukraine, said that the Russians had, the Russian army had staged a full-scale attack on the town. A full-scale attack, a full-scale attack. An AFP reporter on the scene saw a column of eight armored vehicles breaching a rebel-held checkpoint just south of Slan. S-L-A-V-N-Y, S-L-A-V-Y-A-N-S-K, Slavansk, and heard explosions and sporadic small arms fire as the helicopters circled overhead. The raid marked a dramatic escalation in the crisis and jeopardized negotiations to release even seven European OSCE inspectors being held by the Slavanyanks insurgents. The Kremlin said it had an envoy in the East Ukraine negotiating for their freedom, for their own people, men's freedom. Now, a day earlier, Ukraine's interim president reintroduced conscription amid fears of an imminent Russian invasion. Now, the only thing that could save this mess and this is my the perspective from the obedient church of god is there is another election on may the 25th of this year i believe that that will be the trigger point because in this may 25th coming election at the end of our month last week of the month of may here i believe that the election is going to be thrown again, fudged, it's going to be phony, and Putin won't stand for it. Putin won't stand for it. See, in the Ukraine, Putin believes that this whole alleged insurrection rebellion is all staged by the West, which it is. They want to get the West wants to get the reserves of the Ukraine, and there's also in order to supply Europe with gas, natural gas. That's why even all over the United States, you've got this fracking going on, and in Canada where they're forcing the natural gas out of the shale rock and destroying our water supply and our water table in order that we can have more natural gas. So we can sell it to Europe. So that Russia can't sell natural gas to Europe. So we can give them a better price and we'll sell it to Europe. That's why all this fracking is going on in the United States. Well, back to the trigger hair war that could happen at any second. Page two of this report. Oleksandr Turchinov, T-U-R-C-H-Y-N-O-V, has put his armed forces on full combat alert in response to the estimated 40,000 Russian troops that are massed on the border. He has admitted police are powerless to stop a growing insurgency in the eastern part of the country where pro-Russian rebels have seized control of more than a dozen towns and cities. As the crisis rapidly spirals into the worst, the worst East-West confrontation since the end of the Cold War, <laughs> you don't hear anything on the news. Oh, you'll hear a report here or there, but then you'll hear all this tripe on the news all this junk news when this is the worst east-west confrontation since the cuban missile crisis 
And if you were around in the Cuban Missile Crisis, you knew how serious it was. If you're around today in 2014, you're not being told how serious it is. Well, he writes, it's a real battle we are waging against professional, professional mercenaries. That means United States supported mercenaries that are trying to take over the Ukraine with a phony election on May the 25th. And Russia, Putin isn't standing for it. Well, residents are warned to stay indoors. And that's why you should all have guns. Because when this happens in America, America, the same thing, you'll be told to stay indoors. And if there are robbers and looters coming by, you've got to drive them off. You've got to run them off. You've got to have a gun. Well, one Slavanix res resident states, everyone, rebels and Slavan, yes, residents, are determined not to surrender the city. So this is really serious. That's like in the Cuban Missile Crisis, saying, no, we're not going to remove the missiles from Cuba. Well, Central Slovanesk remained relatively calm so far. Although rebel, rebels parked a yeah, previously captured armored vehicle in front of the town hall where the OSCE monitors are being held, so these international monitors can't get in, can't get out, they're captive too. In what they called an anti-terrorist operation, the Ukrainian forces had for days encircled the town to prevent the insurgents receiving reinforcements. See, we've got three forces fighting here. Russian forest Foreign Ministry warned that any effort by Kiev, Kiev to intensify its military operations against its own people in the east could have catastrophic consequences. Okay, so that's if... Let me translate that for you. Putin warned, not the Russian Foreign Ministry, this is called like it is, Putin warned that any effort by Kiev to intensify its military operation against its own people, that means against the Russians in the East, could have catastrophic consequences. And Kiev is a phony puppet government set up by the United States. Putin knows that, we know that. You don't know that because you watch in network news. And I told you, the more news you watch, the stupider you're going to be. More television news, the stupider you're going to be. Because you're going to be programmed. You know, everybody thinks Ronald Reagan was such a great man. He should have been hung. Reagan should have been hung. Reagan sold arms to our enemy, Iran. What if Obama sold arms to Iran today? Eh? Well, Reagan sold arms to Iran. What if Obama refused to let our hostages, if we had any hostages, return? Reagan stopped the hostages from returning. It was known as the October Surprise. What if Obama named Christians as dissenters who should be rounded up and marked for execution. Well, Reagan signed the order that Christians should be labeled as dissenters and be rounded up. Reagan was a devil and his wife was a witch. They all went by the stars and they had astrologers and they set all their appointments by the occult signs. But you think Reagan was a great man. Reagan was a fool. He's a devil. Reagan was an honorary Illuminati. Reagan was at Bohemian Grove. I've got pictures of, Ro of Reagan. And anyone at Bohemian Grove celebrates to Morlock, the devil. You know, the great horned owl where you 
put the body of your children on this, the hands of the owl and you burn them. Well, they burn an effigy that's the, it's not supposed to have a human in the coffin, but they've got a coffin there and they're burning it and Reagan was there. And you think he's a great man. Yeah. Well, way back in the 80s, we were protesting Reagan. He's such a duplicious, lying snake. He turned in fellow Americans. You know, remember McCarthy era? He was turning in all fellow actors. He was a stooge. He was a stooge. And the poor California students, they couldn't go to university anymore because Reagan increased all of their tuition fees. The tuition fees used to be, before Reagan came along, were like 100 bucks, $114 a year. Reagan kicked up the fees, 2000 10000 No one could afford to go to college. Reagan was a devil. Well, your news agencies aren't telling you anything about anything. The Russian news agencies are saying that Moscow is making every effort to de-escalate and settle the conflict, but it also says, Moscow says, Kiev has launched a reprisal raid. Moscow says the raid was essentially finishing off the last hope of the feasibility of the Geneva Accord. So you're tottering on the brink of annihilation. All of us tonight are tottering, teetering, tottering, teetering and tottering on the brink of annihilation tonight. But you watch television news and you think everything's just fine. Hopes have been raised in recent days that the seven OSCE hostages in Slavonansk Four Germans, a Dane, a Czech, and a Pole might soon be released. But the Ukraine has accused the rebels of wanting to use them as human shields. So the lies go on and they aren't released. The West and Kiev believe the chaos in eastern Ukraine is being sown by Moscow in a bid to destabilize the former Soviet Republic ahead of planned presidential elections on May 25th. So now it gets even more convoluted. The Kremlin denies the charges but has reserved the right to use troops to protect Russian speakers in eastern Ukraine, a region with a deep cultural and historical tie to Moscow. So the speakers in the forthcoming election on May 25th are going to be protected by the Kremlin. The Western response has been to launch sanctions against the members of Putin's inner circle and target key firms in a bid to attack Russia's already recession-hit economy. Look, it's all phony, because if you put the sanctions on Russia, that forces Russia to produce more of its $5 solid gold, 90% gold rubles, and that will mean the acceleration of Russia trading for gold instead of Amer using American dollars. So the petrodollar will be toast and it will be the gold ruble. And by you putting on sanctions, you are speeding the process, you fools. Well, the Western response has been to launch those sanctions and Moscow has threatened to retaliate against Western interests in a lucrative energy sector. Hmm. All eyes are now on Obama and Merkel. Yeah, German, German Minister Angela Merkel's meeting in Washington to see what the West's next move will be. Also, later Friday, Russia, Ukraine, and the European Union will hold talks over debts running into billions of dollars that the state-run Russian gas firm Kazprom says Kiev owes. Putin has warned that not paying the bill, which Gazprom estimates at $3.5 billion, could lead to him, Putin, turning off the TAFs, which would also affect several European countries. 
Now it's getting really serious. GM is expected to use a part of its $17 billion loan from the International Monetary Fund uh, to settle the bill. So let's hope that they settle the bill, because this was printed on uh, Wednesday, and I'm reading it today, and let's hope they settle the bill. The unrest in Ukraine, in conclusion here, which started, uh, it actually started with peaceful demonstration in Kiev in November, and that was against pro clamp Kremlin President Viktor Yanukovych's decision to stop the pact for closer integration with the EU has rapidly degenerated into a full-blown global crisis. You know, Yanukovych was forced out, you know, in February because of the crackdown on the protesters. And that sparked uh, anger in Moscow which in return responded with an annexation of the Crimea. The pro-Russian rebels have been steadily taking more ground in the east, and they vow to hold on to their uh, Crimea-style yeah, independence. So now we've got the stage set for a nuclear World War III. Salah, think on that. Your news broadcasts aren't telling you that this is more serious than the Cuban Missile Crisis. We, the Obedient Church of God, are giving you the facts of what is going on in this world. We are on the cusp of war. We're at the cusp of war. And indeed, it also hinges on control of Eurasia. U R A S I A. You know, basically, Eurasia is that's the largest landmass on Earth. And it's the control, the control of Eurasia. You know, Eurasia has been the host of many modern civilizations. All the way back to Mesopotamia, we've got, remember the Silk Road? The Silk Road symbolizes trail and trade and cultural exchange linking Eurasian cultures throughout history and has been an increasingly uh, integral part. Over recent decades, the idea of a greater Eurasian history has developed with the aim of investigating the genetic, cultural, and linguistic relationships between the European and Asian cultures of antiquity. So there we have Europe and Asia being pushed together. So if we see any movement on that front, we will tell you all about it. I want to leave time here for you to tell, for us to tell you about the Middle East and the dividing up of Jerusalem. So we're going to move right into that terrible plan which I announced at the beginning of the broadcast, called the Holy Basin, to split the city of Jerusalem into three parts. Split the city into three parts, Muslim, Christian, and Jewish. But it's God's city. It doesn't belong to anyone to split into any parts. Well, they don't see that. They don't see that at all. Men think that they can do whatever they want. Well, Christ is going to come back, and he's going to put the city back into one part, and he's going to be the king of Jerusalem. Not like King Juan Carlos, who called himself the king of Jerusalem. We won't even get into that one. So the government is going to split up Jerusalem. Where are the church leaders? Hey, this is God's city. Where are the church leaders? Why aren't the church leaders speaking out? 
that you shall not split up Jerusalem. It's God's holy city. Now, government, I remember I told you the government of Jerusalem, Netanyahu and Shimon Perez, they're not even Jews, they're Polish. You know, they might have some, oh, let's just stick with, they changed their names. Those aren't, you know, aren't even their real names. They've had Polish names before. Well, they're the ones behind all this deception also. And it's this terrible plan called the Holy Basin to split Jerusalem between the Christians, the Muslims, and the Jews. Now let me tell you what will happen. The poop, who calls himself a Christian, will get the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Mount Zion. The poop, Christian, will get the Church of the Holy Sepulchre and Mount Zion. The Muslims will get exclusive right to the Temple Mount and not allow the Jews on the Temple Mount. And the poor Jews, they'll have to get permission to visit the Kotel, K-O-T-E-L, the Western Wall. They have to get permission from the Palestinian Authority. You know, the Palestinian Authority denies the Jewish connection to the Western Wall. They say the Jews have no right to be at the Western Wall. Remember I told you in the opening that Palestinian uh, TV is labeled Jewish worship at the Holy Western Wall, sin and filth. Now, even if Jewish worship at the hotel, at the wall, were to continue freely, the loss of access to the Temple Mount would be horrific. The Temple Mount is the holiest site on earth. It's the place where the first temple was. It's the place where the second temple once stood. And this plan is going to deny the Jews the right to be on the first temple grounds and on the second temple grounds. These dirty plans to split Jerusalem's holy sites between various religions, well, they've been secretly planned for a long time. On other broadcasts, I showed you that they were sneak, secret, bro secret plans made in 1992. You know, that's a long time ago. Well, now they're going to be implementing the plans. During the poop's next visit, they, that's going to be in May the 25th, they plan to transfer the Senegal on Mount Zion to the poop. That's what they're planning. And they've been giving parts of the Jewish leadership, Netanyahu and Perez, you know, have been giving pieces away of, of Jerusalem, you know, for the last uh, 10 years. They gave away the Russian compound to Russia. Yeah. Got a notation here. Now we've got Christians that are restoring a church unused until now on the Mount of Olives. And, therefore, the Jews don't have control of that church, that Christian church on the Mount of Olives. Thus, the Jews are slowly selling off Jerusalem. And nobody's realizing it. So you think, oh, it's wonderful that the Christians are going to have a Christian church on the Mount of Olives. Eh? Oh, it's wonderful that the Russians are going to have a compound of their own. Well, Jerusalem won't be owned by the people of Jerusalem anymore. It'll be owned by the Russians and the Russian compound. It'll own, be owned by the Christians who are restoring the church on the Mount of Olives. 
be owned by the Palestinians who will own the Temple Mount. Now slowly they're selling off parts of Jerusalem piece by piece till there's nothing left. And you, none of the rabbis are raising up their voice. Here's the worst one. They're going to take the heart of Jerusalem, the center of Jerusalem, and make it a pagan Roman poop center. They call it a Christian center, but it's a pagan Roman poop center. I got a notation here. It says, remember Rabbi Nisim, N-I-S-S-I-M, when the Pope came to visit 50 years ago, 50 years ago, he insisted that if a Pope wanted to meet him, he could come to his office in Jerusalem. He would not go to greet him. And now, 50 years later, we've got the establishment of Jerusalem just falling all over themselves to meet with the poop. Now the poop's going to be in the upper room, and let me tell you about the upper room. They are giving, the Jerusalem, Shimon Perez and Netanyahu are giving full control to the Vatican of the upper room. That's what they're doing. It's insane. It's insane. They're giving the excuse, Shimon Perez and Netanyahu, they're giving the ex excuse that they don't want the Arabs, uh, you know, upset. They don't want any property damage uh, from the Arab views. Yeah? Well, here's the point. Instead of putting the Arab Jews in jail, you're talking about selling pieces of Jerusalem, splitting up Jerusalem, to stop a handful of Jews who had burned a rug. There's some incident where a handful of Jews, Arab Jews, had burned a rug. And you're going to sell? <laughs> sell your city? <laughs> To foreigners, God city, God city. This is absurd, and yet none of your ministers are speaking. None of your rabbis are speaking out against it, and it's all on plan. It's all on plan. It's all on cue. Pope Francis is going to visit Israel. You know, and the ruse, the um, false flag was, remember, the uh, strike? And there is a strike by Israeli diplomats, but that's all just a distraction. The poop's going to show up on the 24th, come hell or high water, because he wants to take possession of the sites. So, Poop Francis is going ahead with his visit to Jordan. Yeah, and his visit to Israel, and the Palestinian Authority, despite this strike by the Israeli diplomats. So I've got a schedule of the Poop's trip here. The Vatican on Thursday released the program for the papal trip, scheduled for May 24th to 26th. The Pope will have an extensive series of meetings with Palestinian leaders. Yes. And guess who else? Muslim religious leaders. Yes. And guess who else? Three. Orthodox religious leaders. The Orthodox Jews. Four of the Jewish religious leaders. See, Pope Francis is going to be pulling this whole charade together. Now, the general strike called uh, 
by the employees of Israel's foreign ministry has shut down the country's 103 embassies, consulates, and diplomatic missions around the world. That's just a red herring. If they wanted to, they could restaff the embassies in a second. It's just a distraction to make everyone wonder, well, is Francis really going to go to Israel or not? Of course he is. He's going to be claiming the pieces of property. France is also going to fly to Amman, Jordan on the 24th and meet with King Abdullah II and Queen Rania. You know, and addressing the Jordanian authorities and celebrating a mass in the stadium and meeting with refugees and young disabled people. You know, it's such a joke. This Catholic Church who had the Inquisition and killed millions, then they paint themselves as, you know, they're going to meet with young disabled people <laughs> when they murdered millions in their history. Now the Pope will leave Jordan the next day and will fly by helicopter to Bethlehem for a meeting with the Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas. Isn't that a good one, eh? Whom the Vatican Statement referred to as the President of the State of Palestine. That's a new one. Pope Francis will address Palestinian authorities and celebrate mass in Manger Square. Yeah, Pope Francis is quite busy, isn't he? Huh? As well as meet with children. Oh, isn't that sweet? He's going to meet with children while he's destroying the world and setting us all up for World War IV. Because there's going to be a series of war after war after war after war after war after war after war. It's going to be continual war. But he's going to celebrate Mass in Manger Square and meet with children. Well, what's Manger Square? Well, I pulled up a picture of Manger Square. It's one of the things about doing a video broadcast. I can show you where Francis will be speaking. This is Manger Square. Hmm. So he'll be speaking. Pope Francis will be speaking at Manger Square. So if you've learned anything today, you've learned what Manger Square looks like on his itinerary. See, we in the Obedient Church of God go into detail. We even get the pictures for you. Yes. Now, Francis will then fly by helicopter to Jerusalem. This was after, let's get it in order again. Francis will address Palestinian authorities and celebrate mass in Manger Square as well as meet with children. Three refugee camps. Okay, so he's going to the refugee camps. Then Francis is going to fly by helicopter to Jerusalem, where he'll meet with the ecumenical patriarch Bartholomew I of Constantinople. Uh-uh. Getting big time here. Yeah. And sign a joint declaration. I wonder what that declaration can be about. It'll be about chopping up Jerusalem. That evening, in the Basilica of the Holy Sepulchre, an ecumenical meeting will commemorate the 50th anniversary of the meeting in Jerusalem between Pope Paul VI and Patriarch Athenagoras in 1964. So we've got a 50th anniversary here. So these things are all played out like a fine watch. Yeah, and we just think they're just happening by accident? No. <laughs> Got a 50-year anniversary here. On May 26, Francis will visit the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem and give an address. Then he will visit the Western Wall and lay a wreath at Mount Herzl. H-E-R-Z-L. Z-L. He will also visit and speak at Yad, Y-A-D, Vashem before meeting B-A-S-H-E-M, before meeting Israel's two chief rabbis 
at the Heiko Solomo Center, H-E-L-C-H-A-L-S-H-L-O-M-O -E -L -L -O -O Center, next to the Great Synagogue of Jerusalem. And the reason I'm telling you this is to show you how he is covering, Pope Francis is covering all the bases and taking over everything. Later, the Pope will meet separately with Israeli Prime Minister Shimon Peres, whoops, it's President Shimon Peres, and Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Now he, Francis, is covering all the bases. And we're losing God's city. And no one is saying anything. And worse than that, everybody's calling it just a visit. Just a, just a visit, eh? Well, let me tell you, they're formalizing diplomatic relations. Jerusalem is signing an agreement to formalize diplomatic relations with the Holy See, with the Catholic Church. That means that the the city of Jerusalem is acknowledging the authority of the Catholic Church. Why would the state of Israel be signing diplomatic relations with the Vatican? Well, the international news has been quiet for almost eight years on any diplomatic moves by the Vatican with the state of Israel. Now, but with this announcement, there came a report of conflicting and disturbing reports concerning the status of the upper room. Now the upper room is known, bear note, is the cynical shrine of the Konakulum, C-O-E-N-A-C-U-L-U-M, where it's believed that the Jewish rabbi, Yeshua, They've got it all in their Jewish name. It's it's Yesh, it's Jesus, <laughs> where it's believed that Yeshua once hosted the last dinner. Hmm. They've even got got it. Uh, oh, that's interesting. Okay, they've got. They've got according to the Passover tradition of the Essenes. Now the Essenes was where the religious group that kept true and faithful to all of the teachings of the first century church. Hmm. Well, just so you know, for, your Jew, for the Jewish uh, students out there, for some reason, we've chosen to call Yeshua, spelling it Y-E-H-S-H-U-A, and then Ha, capital H-A, capital N-O-T-Z-R-I which I translates the closest I can figure out is Jesus the Nazarene. Hmm. Okay. Now, the tomb of David is underneath that building. Got a notation here. What is most interesting is that this um, Prince of David was actually presiding. That's Yeshua. They got it so convoluted the way they speak. What is most interesting is this prince, that Prince of David, Yeshua, was actually presiding over a Passover seasonal meal with his disciples in a place that the Nazarenes historically called the house with the upper room. What was even more amazing was that this upper room was located physically in the midst of the Essene quarters of southwestern section of the ancient walled city of Jerusalem. Not only that, this Prince King of David, that's Yeshua. Not only that, Yeshua was sitting right over the traditional tomb of King David. 
And that made a powerful political statement for Yeshua to be sitting over the tomb of King David. So, bear note, we've got Yeshua sitting over the, king, the tomb of King David. Now, what's going to be happening this month? We're going to have the poop sitting where Yeshua sat over the throne of King David. Do you get it? Do you get how he's setting himself up in place of God? You know, as a vicar of Christ, they call him himself since day one. That's in place of God. So that's why, here's your bear note, that's why it is so important for the poop to be in the upper room because Yeshua, HaMashiach, was in the upper room over the place. So, now we've got the Pope playing the role, mocking the role, actually, of Yeshua. This is not good. It's a powerful political statement that the poop is equal to Yeshua. Because Yeshua had the Last Supper in the upper room, allegedly above the tomb of King David, and that's where the poop is going to have a mass. That's right. So don't believe any of these reports that they say they don't know if he's going to have a mass or not. Yes, he is. All those reports are just disinformation to keep the, the, the lid on. Now this, this same site is the central campus of the Diaspora Yeshiva on the hill called Mount Zion. Back in October 2005, Bible searcher reflections quoting Israel National News stated this report. An official, this is in 2005, an official Vatican newspaper has reported that during his upcoming visit to the Vatican, President Moshe Katzvaz, K A T S A V, will sign an agreement giving parts of David's tomb over to papal control. In such an agreement, if such an agreement is signed, it will put an end to drawn-out negotiations that began in 1998. Israel and Vatican representatives began discussing issues of jurisdiction over certain sites around seven years ago. These sites include various buildings and parcels of land that the Catholic Church claims it used to control. The church is now seeking to reclaim its ownership of these sites. This is back in 2005, this is written. Among the places under debate is an area that the church refers to as the site of the Last Supper, which is situated at the burial site of kings of David, Saul of Ben, Rehoboam, and Asa, and Hezekiah, and Amaziah. Now we got a, the Vatican newspaper, El Messengero, El Messengero, <laughs> reports that President Katsav is, exper is expected to sign an agreement during his visit that will give the church, the poop, control over the upper part of David's tomb. The church has already shown Israel a trial agreement according to which the Vatican will receive. So there you have it. This was all scammed out in October of 2005. Hmm. Got a whole bunch more information on this than I could give you. Let's give you the pertinent parts of this as I decipher it. The historic move of the Vatican, by the Vatican, in October 13th, 2005, historic move. It's not a historic move. 
it's a, a, a planned, sneaky move that no one knew about in two, that it wasn't even broadcast in 2005, and now it just comes to light that the Pope is going up to take possession of the upper room on May the 26th this month. This is all planned out 2005. Yeah. So that was like eight years ago, nine years ago. Well, that's your timeline. Now, the current site of the church with the upper room was rebuilt by the Crusaders in the 13th century. And they, it was, what it says here is, upon the earlier foundations of the original Jewish-Hebrew Nazarene synagogue that was spared by the Roman general Titus, in the Roman destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD, so that's pretty interesting. Today is also believed that three walls of this current structure still exist from the earliest Jewish roots built by the guardians of King David's tomb. Let me tell you something that I that crossed my mind. I've seen in research that some of the stones from the second temple's destruction were actually used in the construction of this upper room. And these are big stones. These are stones like five feet by eight feet long. They're, they're huge, big blocks, let's put it that way, whatever their dimensions are. But they're from the second temple. And they're forming some of the wall of the upper room. And we've got a poop who's going to be sitting in the upper room. This could fit in with the holy place. Bear note, this could fit in with the holy place. But the holy place is supposed to be in the temple. But they've brought the stones from the temple to construct the upper room. Interesting scenario there. Well, back on, this was in 70 AD, as you know, that the temple was destroyed. And there, it's currently believed that three walls of the upper room still exist to their earliest Jewish roots. But one wall built with the stones of the temple, of the second temple. I've got a notation here. The Holy Zion Octagonal Church was later built by Theodosius I about 382 Christian era and later enlarged by Bishop John II into a rectangular basilica with five naves alongside the outside and outside the original. We should get off on that. Here's the, the point that we're dealing with here, though. It's an ancient foundation of the historic synagogue of the Nazarene's apostles. So the whole sentence here. Five naves alongside and outside the original and ancient foundations of the historic synagogue of the Nazarene Apostles. This latter building was raised to the, by the Persians in uh, 1614 and partially rebuilt by the Patriarch Modestus. Okay, we're, we're not going to get into the, all the history of the upper room. Okay. Now, they, let's just keep things as simple as we can without getting into all the history or we'll run out of time. Let's show you a picture of the upper room. I like to see this. I've got more than one picture, but this is one picture that you can see of the upper room.
we're putting this all together and we're seeing that the Pope is trying to portray himself as Yeshua, sitting in the same place as Yeshua sat. We go through all the history of the upper room. But the point of all of this is that on the 26th, they're going to sign the agreement giving complete control, complete control of the upper room to the poop. That's right. But they're saying they're not going to give possession of it to the poop. Well, if you've got complete control, you might as well have possession of it. It's unbelievable, you know, the trickery they've got. If I give you complete possession of something, of my car, and I still own it, but you've got complete possession, that means I, you can't, I can't take it back because you've got complete, complete, complete possession of it. Hmm. And all this is tying into prophecies. I wonder if you've got time to go into the Malachi prophecies. You know, the Malachi prophecies tie into the new Pope Francis the first here. You know, he's he's fulfilling the uh, prophecy of Saint Malachi. These are prophetic visions of the prophet Malachi. Do we have time to go into this? Let's see if I can condense this page somehow. No, it's too long, it's too convoluted. Let's go into what's happening today. Today, the outgoing deputy foreign minister, here's the latest scam going on today, okay? We've got an outgoing foreign minister, Israel's foreign minister, Avador Lieberman, who has recently taken a leave of absence awaiting trial for charges of fraud and breach of truth, not of trust, breach of truth. <laughs> That's what all our offshoot ministers are <laughs> guilty of, breach of truth. They say they obey the Bible and they don't, they celebrate <laughs> Turkey God Day, they you know, refuse to celebrate New Moon Day, and they move God's Sabbath to the sixth day of the week, and then they say they, <laughs> they obey God's Bible. <laughs> Joke. Breach of truth are about to face off in court over charges that include money laundering and bribery. Here's the point. Both of these servants of the state of Israel officially represented the state of Israel with the Vatican in Rome's legal dispute for the sovereignty rights to multiple sites in Judea and Samaria. So now we're getting these, the outgoing deputy foreign minister, Daniel Eyalon, he's being shoved out of, out of the way because he had represented the position of Israel with going against the Vatican. So he's being removed. Now, there's another side to this also. It's like an enigma wrapped inside a riddle here. Got in my notes, over the years, he's all, he, the Danny Eilalon, you know, who was supposed to be defending Israel from being taken over by the Vatican, has been implicated in a cozy relationship with the Vatican in Rome. And not only with the Vatican and Rome, but with numerous Christian evangelical organizations who also continually seek possession to claim and possess the sacred land in the land of Israel, but also the political rights to missionize and proselytize Jews into becoming apostate Christians. So this goes even deeper. Not only are they taking over the land, 
but they are going to missionize the Jews and put their phony Catholic dogma onto the Jews. Now, according to the Jewish Israel, Jewish Israel has repeatedly expressed concern over any negotiations which would compromise Mount Zion. We have been especially concerned over Daniel Ela Yalon's position as chief negotiator on Vatican issues since he is a maverick when it comes to ventures to grant Christians special status in Israel. <sighs> Well, he and his wife, Anna, are intimately involved with the evangelical and Catholic communities and have comfortably appeared on missionary television. Anna has significant business and real estate dealings with, Christian, with the Christian community and was listed as the talking head for the Pope's visit on Christian-Israel relationships in a pamphlet put out by the Israel Project. TIP, the Israel Project, at the time of Pope Benedict XVI's visit in May of 2009. This is getting all involved again here. All right, let's 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 stick to the point here. We've got Francis, we've got the Vatican taking over everything they can get their paws on in Israel. We've got collusion with the Israeli leaders who are supposed to be defending the land of Israel. And all of these incidents, we've got the finger of Francis involved in this somewhere. Now, let's ask the question, will we soon see Pope Francis I reincarnated as the new Francis of Assisi. Put that in your bear notes. So why did he call, why did he choose the name Francis? Bear note, probably, so that he could dupe people into thinking of him as Francis of Assisi and carry forth uh, the Franciscan order, the mantle of the uh, Franciscan order of friars who have over the centuries sought complete control and rights of the land of Israel. So, St. Francis of Assisi, St. Francis I, well, St. Francis of Assisi was one of the most uh, venerated religious figures in all of history. So now it's starting to make sense why we've got Pope Francis in the picture here, why he chose the name Francis. See, all this scheming, all this scheming is just like to program the masses. Now, I've got something really interesting for you to lighten things up since I'm showing things on camera. I blew up a picture, like enlarged a picture, of East and West Jerusalem. And lo and behold, because I like doing things like this, I like finding intrigues. Lo and behold, West Jerusalem, the actual land, an aerial view, looks like a man blowing a shofar. And a shofar is a warning of war. And East Jerusalem looks like the Statue of Liberty. I'm not making this up, and I'm going to show you the picture to prove it. You'll be amazed by this. It actually looks, West Jerusalem actually looks like a man blowing a shofar. I'm not making this up, folks. I'm going to show you the picture. God must lead me into these things, because nobody else has ever noticed this. Look at the blue. Okay, the blue is West Jerusalem. Now, if I put my finger on this, you can see the man's leg. 
You can see the shofar. You can even see the man's nose and his mouth. Let's get a bigger picture from my desk. Let's use this picture. It's bigger. Okay, let's try this again. There's the man's leg. There's the shofar. There's his hair, eyebrows, nose, mouth. Chin, back, derriere, thigh, calf, ankle, foot. That's West Jerusalem, folks. Now let's look at East Jerusalem. Aha! Semiramis, Statue of Liberty. I'm not making this up. It's unbelievable, isn't it? Eh? Well, you saw it first here on the Obedient Church of God. We got some interesting scenarios here. So we thought we'd, we'd put that in to lighten things up a bit here. Because this is a terrible, terrible plan called the Holy Basin to split Jerusalem between Muslims, Jews, and Christians, but to not have the Jews have authority to even go to the Western Wall unless the Palestinians allow it. You know what's going to happen there. There's going to be some stupid little petty incident and then the Palestinians are going to say, no, 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 can't go to the Western Wall, we can't have any more incidents. Yeah, we can just see it all here, how it's going to play out. And remember, loss of access to the Temple Mount is loss of access to the first temple and the second temple. Where the first temple stood and the second temple stood. Their dirty plan to split Jerusalem holy sites has existed a long time. I've shown you way back, 1998, 2005, and it, in another broadcast, I remember I brought up the papers from 1992, where they had planned to be chopping up Israel, and they've got, they're going to sign it all up. This, the 26th, they're going to sign the papers. And none of the rabbis are screaming out in protest. None of the ministers in America are screaming out in protest at the sale of God's holy city, Jerusalem, piece by piece. No one's screaming out. Nobody's raising their voice up against it, except we, the obedient church of God. So think on this. Salah. We, the obedient Church of God, are being led by God to know what exactly is going on. And to give you clarity, here's your bare note. The Vatican will control, have complete control of the upper room, complete authority over the upper room. They just won't have possession of it. The word used is sovereignty. The Vatican does not have sovereignty, but what difference does that make if they've got complete control of the upper room? That Israel gave the Vatican the special modicum of control over the whole site. Except the hook is the trick is that Israel didn't give up the sovereignty. Well, if you give up the control of your car to someone else, you've given up the sovereignty of your car to someone else. But no, not the way this tricky generation works. So now you know what's really going on with the poops and visits. Now you know the rest of the story of what's going on on Mount, we've mentioned even 
Well, we're not going to go into any more topics. We're out of time. We should, we're going to stop right there. We're going to stop right there. And in conclusion, the Pope is going to sit in the same place as Yeshua sat, claiming to be the Vicar of Christ, to be Christ himself. And that place, the upper room, since it has stones from the second temple, could actually be the place where they set up the idol and or the place where the Pope goes in to call himself, he already calls himself the Vicar of Christ, but to call himself God. Where he, because Yeshua sat there in that upper room, and now you've got the poop sitting there in the upper room. So long. Uh, think on that. That's the broadcast for today. Can't help it. We're out of time again. Got a whole bunch more files. Here we go. Look at all these files. Huh? We do our research. But all please rise. Boy, the tape runs out here for the broadcast. And take your beautiful hymnals. And we want to sing, He Shall Reign Forevermore. Because the poop can sit all he wants in the upper room, and it's not going to make a hill of beans different to the outcome. Because Yeshua HaMashiach is going to reign forevermore. So all please sing out. Page number 78, and let's tell them who's going to reign forevermore. God's ways are going to reign forevermore, and we are restoring God's new moon day, have restored it. We have restored the Sabbath day to the seventh day in all of the world. We have restored the four feasts of the Lord. We have restored the Last Supper. We have restored the Passover to 19 minutes before sundown on the 14th. We are the obedient church of God. We are the Romans 928 work. We are the work of restoring all things and restoring the rain, preparing for the rain of Yeshua. Sing out. <laughs>
Almighty Father, with Yeshua at your right hand side. Yeshua, we feel so sorry that the Pope, the Satanist Pope, is trying to imitate you, Yeshua. It's such a travesty. It breaks our heart. Uh, you had given your life and how you had spilled out your blood. And then we have some man trying to claim equality with you by sitting at your place in the upper room. Thank you for your great patience, Yeshua. And Father, thank you for your great patience. Thank you for your great plan that we've got to let the script play out so that thy witness can be that this whole mess is going to turn into one war after another war after another war to prove that only your way works, Father. So protect your obedient Church of God. Help us be safe. Help our members to be safe. Because at any time, there could be the start of the Third World War, Fourth World War, Fifth World War, war after war. Rumors of wars, plural, you said, Father. We put ourselves in the hollow of your hand, and indeed, we thank you for the knowledge that you've given us. That maybe in the upper room you could see that that is a holy place and that that is where the Pope will declare himself to be God. Oh, it's so saddening. It's like we're like melancholy sparrows, Father, having to put up with all this and having to put up with all the abuse from men who call themselves your ministers when they don't follow your word. Well, it's all in your hands. Therefore, we commit these ministers into your hands and we just like melancholy sparrows in a pelican alone we stand firm in your word alone in your word and watching all these things transpire speed your kingdom and now we ask for your dismissal and we ask it all in your, sh and your protection for this coming week anything can happen on the hill and thanks that nobody gets hurt on the hill this coming week and that the police don't bother us, and the income tax department, and all the rest of the machinations of Satan. So, we ask to be kept safe in the whole of your hands for another week until we meet again with you on the Sabbath in worship service. We ask it all in Yeshua's holy righteous name, our soon arriving King of Jerusalem. Amen. Yeah, we know who the real king is. Yes, we do. It is Yeshua HaMashiach. And his mighty works and his wonderful works are going to transpire. So, in conclusion, are we going to give thanks and praise the Eternal? Yes, because he has triumphed gloriously. So we're going to give thanks and praise the Eternal. That's the broadcast for today.